couple years before I transferred to San Francisco State. The reason why I transferred to San Francisco State was because I took a human sexuality class here and uh, loved every minute of it. The professor wasn't as awesome as Gina. Um, <laughs> that they, the, I won't name any names, but they had said that they had been celibate for 10 years and were still recommending the diaphragm to 18 year olds, um, which is something Planned Parenthood didn't even do at that time. And uh, yeah, I still loved every second of it. They, made, they somehow tried to make the class very dry. They didn't try to, it just happened that way. But I still loved it and couldn't get enough of all the textbooks and that's actually why I decided to transfer to San Francisco State because they have a human sexuality program there. So I majored in psychology, minored in human sexuality and then continued on to do many things. Uh, it was actually through that program in San Francisco where I went to Good Vibrations. Anyone know of Good Vibrations in the city? Um, they're actually not just in the city anymore, they're all over now. Uh, it's their very sex positive educational sex shop there. Um, now there's probably like eight or ten of them in the country and saw that and called my mom after, after that field trip and I said, Mom, we should open a sex shop. We should open up one of these in Santa Cruz. It wouldn't be Good Vibrations, it would be our own. Um, at this point I was 22 or 23. Um, 22 probably. 21, I don't know, somewhere around there. And my mom was like, a sex shop? Uh, okay, let's talk about that. But we started to play with the idea and uh, two years later we actually opened the store in Santa Cruz and now it's called Pure Pleasure Shop. It used to be downtown next to the library on Church Street of all places. Um, <laughs> and now we have been, I can't remember if we're going to our third year or second year. Two and a half years at the new location, yeah. Um, uh, down on Cooper Street, right by the restaurant Lely, or across from Abbott Square, right in that area down there. And uh, from there, I went on to become a certified sex educator. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's a really great program training that happens twice a year in San Francisco through SFSI. It's sfsi.org. Um, it's a 60-hour training where they train people to uh, be sex educators. And from there, I also did a training in Somatica, which is a sex and relationship coaching training. I um, also have done trainings with Urban Tantra uh, and my most, and also in yoga, which has nothing to do with <laughs> sex. And I got really bored of that because it didn't have anything to do with sex, so I put that aside. And then I started a podcast called The Shameless Sex Podcast. Uh, that I've been doing for two years, I believe, in early June will be our two year anniversary. I have a co-host named April, who's one of my best friends. She also works in the sex toy industry, uh, and we do weekly episodes. It's entirely free. Does anyone not listen to podcasts in here at all? All right, yeah, if you don't, no judgment, but um, it's on all of the apps, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, all the things, and uh, like I said, it's completely free. It's educational. Uh, we bring in educators from all over to talk about all kinds of topics, like Tantra and kink and you know, how to communicate with your partners and all kinds of in between. So there's endless things. Threesomes, that's the most recent one that's coming out next week. It's going to be an exciting one. People love the threesome episodes. Uh, so yeah, Shameless Sex Podcast up there. Uh, and yes, and then I see clients privately too. Uh, I work with couples, I work with individuals, people in relationship, people not in relationship, uh, all genders, all orientations. and. Uh, that people usually come to me as a sex and relationship coach, they're usually coming to me for guidance, for I'm stuck right here in my sex, my sex life or my sexuality and I want to go over here but I don't know how to get there. Um, and it's different than therapy in, the, in therapy, in sex therapy, what they're spending a lot of time doing, what therapists are doing, is spending a lot of time on the past stuff, you know, your childhood wounding, um, you probably already all know this, but most of our stuff that is really challenging for us today has a lot to do with what happened when we were young people. Um, and even not even young people, even in our teenage years and our first sexual experiences and all of that. So um, I do a little bit of work with folks on their past stuff, but what I'm doing mostly is working with where they're presently stuck and a little dabble in the past, but mostly giving them tools, guidance, resources to move forward into the, the future, wherever that is that they want to go. Um, I'm currently in a training called Hakomi. Uh, Hakomi is a holistic psychotherapy practice that, um, so I'm not, I'm actually not a certified or licensed is the word therapist, nor am I trying to be, but I'm getting more 
tools and resources to work with people on their, um, their stuff. And that involves working with their past traumas and things. Uh, in my opinion, in the world of therapy, does anyone love therapy here like me? I love therapy, yeah. <laughs> I have a therapist I see right now once a month, um, and I'm pretty sure I will do it for the rest of my life. Um, and in the world of therapy, there's so many different modalities. I'm a huge fan of Hakomi. No, it's not Japanese. Um, it, Hakomi is actually a Hopi word, so Hopi Native Americans. Uh, and I forgot exactly what it means, but it is about lo bringing loving presence while you're working with someone. Um, in whatever is present for them in that moment. So um, I won't go too deep into that, but I'm a huge fan of Hilkomi therapy and EMDR therapy for folks who have a lot of trauma stuff, um, which I'll talk about now. Um, so some of the most common issues that I work with people on um, would be shame and trauma, although my training in trauma is very light, right? I'm, again, I'm not a, a licensed therapist, so I don't have many, many years and, of, of education and of, um, of history in working with trauma. I can do some light trauma work. If I have a client that comes and they have a lot of trauma, like say they had a lot of sexual abuse when they were younger, they never worked on it with a therapist, I would probably refer them out to a therapist and either also work with them on the side or just have them work with that person. Uh, if they have come to me and they have done some work around their trauma and now they're looking more for the tools of like, okay, I've done the work around the trauma. I don't you know, disassociate the way I used to or, um, or get as triggered as I used to when someone touches me and maybe it still comes up a little bit, but now I want tools to move forward so that I can have more connected sex or um, more exciting sex or whatever that is, be more in my body, then I can work with that, that person. Um, so that's trauma. It's in, the body is, is so brilliant and that's a great thing because when our body, our body lets us know when there's something that we need to pay attention to, right? It gives a, a symptom like your heart racing or um, you feel like you're, you're shrinking and want to run away or you feel like you're getting small or you're sweating profusely um, or, or maybe even disassociations and things where you don't even feel like you're here. Those are all signs that there's something here going on that is asking you to take care of it. The only thing is, is that we're kind of cultured to ignore that, um, to pretend like those things aren't there, to override the system, to not go into the challenging feelings. Um, and some of those are, are really hard to go into. Like if you're disassociating, it's actually, you, that is something to get support on because when you're actually not here, it's pretty hard to bring yourself here unless you've done work to, um, to practice doing that. So that's the good thing about the body and its brilliance in it remembering the trauma uh, that has happened to us and giving us physical, physiological symptoms now. Um, but the hard thing about it is, is that those things pop up and they get in the way of us connecting with ourselves and connecting with others. Um, so it's not, it's not all an entirely a, a terrible thing. A lot of times when people go through those processes, they're like, I don't want this, I don't want to feel this way, I don't like that this, this is here. But we can actually look at it as an opportunity instead, like an opportunity to do the work to seek the support um, so that we can have more connected uh, sex and relationships. Shame, I think, will go in a similar category as trauma. They're kind of separate, and yet they can kind of be in the same thing. Trauma can happen in a lot of ways, by the way. A lot of times we think of trauma as non-consensual acts of sexual violence when it comes to sexuality. But trauma can happen from um, giving birth to a child can be a major trauma on your body that you consented to. But it was, it's pretty traumatic in that it changed your body. It, there was a lot that went on in that process, and a lot of times people who give... Um, give birth, they actually do, and they wouldn't call it trauma work, but it really is work around reconnecting with their body and parts of themselves that may have um, either turned off or may have had like, you know, tears or things that didn't feel, feel good. And um, so trauma can happen in a lot of ways. And a lot of times it does happen in consensual, in consensual environments. Uh, and trauma can also be emotional, right? It doesn't have to be a physical thing that happens to my body. I can have emotional trauma um, from various experiences. So shame is uh, similar and different. So uh, anyone familiar with Brene Brown's work? Anyone Brene Brown? Yeah? No? Not really? Okay. Brene Brown, does anyone have, does anyone have Netflix? Yeah? Cool. There's a, uh, I don't think it's an hour long. There's a Brene Brown thing on there. Yeah, I haven't even watched it yet. But she has a, so if you have Netflix, you can watch it. She's brilliant. She does a lot of work around worthiness, vulnerability, and shame. She also has TED Talks. She has many, many books. 
uh, and she does a lot of really important work around that. And what she says is that there's a diff very different, big difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is that thing I did is bad. Shame is I'm bad. You know, the, and the, so they feel different in our body. Guilt, we can still pre feel pretty shitty when we feel guilt. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily run at our core of I'm a terrible person the way shame does. Usually when we feel shame, it's I don't want anyone to know this about me because then they'll know that I'm a bad person. Um, that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're a bad person when you feel shame, but that's the internal story that we go through. And there is no hierarchy of shame, right? One person's shame could be different from another. Uh, I might feel shame because my partner uh, cheated on me and I don't want anyone to know because if they know, they'll know that I'm not a desirable person. Again, this is not true, but this is the internal story I could go through. I'm not desirable. I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. So I don't want them to know because I have deep shame around this story. Whereas another person can be like, fuck it. That person screwed me over. I'm going to tell the world uh, because it's not shameful for them. So it can happen in different, different ways for people. And what Brene Brown says is to work with shame. So shame thrives in silence and secrecy, meaning I don't tell anyone about it. I bottle it up, I hold it in. You can think of it as bacteria in a petri dish that it just literally just multiplies because I'm carrying it all on my own. And then she says it dies in, in, um, in, in empathy, in sharing and empathy with other, other folks that are, are worthy of your shame and worthy is probably not the right word, but who can handle your shame, right? If I have a friend who I talk about my shame and they are just like, ugh, or that's, that's weird, I don't want to talk about that, or they start fixing me, well, you should do this, you should do this, or like, screw that, that thing, like, oh, you should get over it, it's not a big deal. Not the person to share your shame with. And shame is something that we share with, with either therapists or coaches or family members or friends who can be like, I love you in all of your vulnerability, right? Whether you're crying, you're angry, you're screaming, whatever it is, as long as you're not punching me in the face. And I, I can hold this for you because I care about you and I'm just here to support you and hear you. Um, in fact, when you're sharing something with, that is really big for you, um, it's really helpful to uh, let the person know what it is that you're looking for. The natural tendency for a lot of folks is to fix. I am a fixer. I'm one of those people who's had to work really hard not to just go to like all the solutions on all the ways that things can be better for the person that's coming to me. Because oftentimes that's not what they want, or they might not even know that's not what they want. Um, so to let them know, hey friend, I have some shame, or I have something that's really big for me, and I'm not looking to be fixed, I'm just looking to be heard. Do you think that you can hold that space for me? And give them the opportunity to consent, or to decide, you know, yes, no, or, and then you're also reminding them, like, please don't fix me, and if they start fixing, you can just lovingly stop them. And, I understand you have a lot of great solutions here and I'm just still just looking to be heard and it can be really powerful. So when, that's some of the work that I'm doing with clients is they don't have people that to share their deepest, darkest, scary secrets. They don't want people to know that they're really into you know, having someone urinate on them. Yes, that is as part of a, a kink for some folks. Um, or they don't want people to know that they um, have desire for someone other than their, their husband or their wife or their partner, whomever that is, you know, little things like that. And again, to you, as you hear that, you might be like, yeah, that, uh, why would you feel shame about that? But to another person, it, it really might be. Uh, so, so that's really big. And you, this is the thing to think about shame and trauma. When you're carrying them in yourselves, you can think of them as armor, right? So I have the shame and I'm not, I'm not working with it, right? And I, I used to say my job was to eradicate shame. I don't really think that's true anymore. I think my job is to really uh, educate and inspire people to work with their shame instead because shame can actually be a really powerful teacher on what we want to do differently and what lessons are here and how we want to, to grow. Um, and so when I carry all my shame and my trauma and I don't do the work, think of it as armor on my body, invisible armor that's preventing me from really sharing myself because it's been scary out there, all the shame and trauma. Why would I share myself, my emotional self or my physical self with other people when it's bad things have happened? Um, and when I do that work around the shame and trauma, think of just layers of armor that come off and all of a sudden I might be able to be more connected and open or loving or whatever that is that you're looking for and have more orgasms maybe. Ooh. It's true, it's all related. <laughs> um, another thing that I work with people on is something called desire discrepancy. Um, this is super common. I'll just I'm really not going to go too deep into this one. Desire discrepancy is something where you have, say, two people, and there could be three people, four people, depends on what you're doing. 
um, two people and quite often they have different levels of desire. One person might want sex five days a week, another person might want sex one day a week and they have to work together to, um, or they don't have to, they have the opportunity to work together to meet each other somewhere in the middle to meet each other's needs. Um, it's If you're uh, getting a long-term relationship, uh, it's pretty common for you to come into that at some point where someone wants more sex or less sex than the other person. Uh, and it doesn't mean that one person meets the other and the other one gives up their desires. That's not what we, what we want. Everyone, to as much as they can, wants to get their needs met and works together. And we'll talk more about negotiation, do a negotiation exercise here, but like I, I'll, I'll emphasize this a lot. Relationships really are a negotiation. It's a, a constant negotiation. And if um, you don't like the word work, people say relationships are work, you're like, oh, I don't want that. If, you know, if you're one of those people that was that would like to think their relationship should be easy, well, I say good luck to you on that. And <laughs> I wonder who told you that. And because they aren't, yes, we want them to be smoother and easier and more juicy and loving and enjoyable than not and um, that that work that negotiation the repair when things are hard is a part of being in relationship with pretty much anyone even if it's not a romantic or uh, sexual relationship uh, so other things communication breakdowns this is huge this is a big thing I'm working on with people and this includes teaching people about boundaries again we're going to do an exercise on that in a couple minutes um, and boundaries could be, uh, and this, boundaries are really big for a lot of people. You might think you have really great boundaries until maybe we do this exercise and you're like, whoa, maybe not. Don't worry, we're not touching genitals in here. It's going to be arms and hands. Uh, and so a lot of folks, boundaries have been really hard. They've had boundaries crossed in the past in places. Maybe when they were kids, they had boundaries crossed and they didn't have a voice then. Like they could speak, but they didn't know that they could voice up to it. And now as an adult, it's really hard for them and scary to voice boundaries because what happens when I voice a boundary with someone and I turn them down and reject them and I might lose love. I might lose affection. Um, I might be rejected. You know, a lot of things are at risk there for that. So teaching people about boundaries um, teaching people how to ask for what they want uh, is part of boundaries, but also how to ask for what you want when it comes to sex, whether it's a big thing like, I want to open up a relationship and not be monogamous anymore, um, or little things like uh, when you touch my nipples, you, uh, I would, it's feeling a little aggressive and I'd like it a little softer and lighter and how to teach people how to have those conversations. You, I mean, again, if you're one of those people who are like, why is that hard for anyone? Awesome for you, but for a lot of people, it's really, really, really hard. And in fact, I feel like more people than not that I speak to, it's those little things are cha really challenging. Um, I also teach people how to share vulnerability, um, so how to speak from what they're actually feeling. Um, again, for some of you, it might be like, why is that hard? But for a lot of people, that's really, really difficult. First of all, you have to be able to feel what you're feeling. Um, so to be present in your body, to feel the feelings that are in your body and to just share what is present from that place. There's a lot of really important stuff that happens when we share vulnerability and one of that is connection with ourselves and with others. You really, it's really hard to have deep connection with people when you're not sharing vulnerability and you're kind of masking or holding all that you're feeling. Uh, and then before we go into the exercise, another thing that I'm working with people is presence and disconnect from their bodies. Um, this is one of the one of the bigger things. No matter what, if someone's coming, like I want to have more juicy orgasms, or um, I just I want to have any, anything better, better sex, better connection with my partner when we're having sex. Um, I, one of the things I ask them is, okay, when you're touching or being touched, are you even there? Are you even there, present for it? And they're like, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, of course I'm there. My body's there. We're touching. There's fingers, hands going on me. But then I ask them, okay, but are you really there? Like if there's a hand touching all of your body, are you staying present with the hand or are you in here thinking, what am I going to do later? What am I have for dinner? I have so much laundry I have to do. Oh, Gina gave me all this homework. I have to go in the sex shop. I really don't want to go in the sex shop. I hate sex shops. And, or, or that's one version of not being here. Another version of not being here would be, you know, hands touching me and me thinking, I'm not going to orgasm. Are they even into this? I'm taking too long. What do I look like? Do I look pretty enough? Do I look sexy enough? Um, you know, am I sweating too much? Is my breath bad? And like, there's a hand all over my body. And I'm like, just thinking about all these things that are not even really related to the touch. So I spend a lot of time teaching people how to, um, to stay more present for touch. And I'll just ask, is, it, is anyone 
not guilty of doing that, of having a hand touch you and you, is anyone like, I'm always really present for that? Because I'm not. I actually can't raise my hand. You can? Oh my God, we're hanging out. We got to talk. <laughs> I most certainly cannot the whole time. I, and it's a practice. Anyone meditate? Meditators? Yeah? Okay. For you all, you're like, yes. For people who don't like meditation, this is really challenging because my belief is really great connected sex is a meditation. Meaning you're, you're, pro, fo, you're present and focused on one thing and that is touch or sen, you know, sensation or the connection or the sensations of whatever your partners are going through. But when we have all the other things going on, it's hard to have really great connected sex. You can probably have good sex. You might have great sex. You can totally have great sex. But that really connected sex where you're like, wow, we were totally there with each other and it was like you were playing my, my body like it was a guitar, um, involves that single pointed focus on the touch and the sensation. Not the super analytical, you know, judgy voice in your head of am I touching them right? Is That's not the same thing. It's like, okay, as I touch them, what are the sensations here? Are they... You know, how are they breathing? Are their cheeks getting really rosy? And what does the skin feel like on my skin? And is it getting engorged? And you're staying present with all of that. That's the meditation. Um, so actually, I teach people how to meditate even outside of sex. And uh, it's really powerful. So if there's one thing that you want to start doing as a regular practice to be more connected with your body and other bodies is just to take up a regular meditation practice, even if it's five minutes a day to start um, practicing that single point of focus on one thing, either you know breath or your or your body, and there's you can YouTube all kinds of guided meditations uh, if it's this is new to you. Um, but I, for most of my clients, when they start to do that, you know at least a couple days a week, it does carry over into into sex. Um, and when I say sex, this also all applies to self pleasuring too. So. Um, I can have really great connected sex that is a meditation, a single point of focus with partners. I can also have it with myself and my, my own body. Um, a lot of people are detaching from their own bodies when they're self-pleasuring too. And we have a lot of ways that we can do that. Um, I'm not anti-porn. I don't think porn's a great sex educator. I think it's designed for entertainment. And if we're always watching porn while we're self-pleasuring, we, we're usually not here for the, the full thing. So um, it's all just a balance of, of bringing things in in a way that um, is like a fun enhancer, uh, but not making them the way that we're all, um, always leaving our body to have an experience. Um, so anyways, that's my little spiel on that. Let's go into exercises. So this exercise right now is going to be a combination of kind of a lot, all these things, probably not desire discrepancy, but maybe um, the communication breakdown. So we're, talk, we're going to talk about boundaries, negotiation in here. Um, and then also presence is a huge thing uh, as well. So we're going to do, Gina and I will demo it. So this is something that's going to be called the bossy massage. And this is your invitation to be bossy as all hell. You don't have to be all nice and would you please and no thank you and all this stuff. No, no, we don't have to do that. Um, so when we do the exercise, the invitation is for the person that is the receiver to just say, do this, do that, you know, or, or more pressure, less pressure, stop. And things like that. And then for the giver to actually listen to the, this person and to do what the person wants, but while negotiating though, right? Because as the giver, just because someone says, I want more pressure, and if you're like, I don't, I'm getting a big no on giving you more pressure, you still get to negotiate, right? So this is a big thing here. We, I, we don't want to have compliant sex or touch where we give up a part of ourselves and we're getting a big old no. Because trauma actually can happen from that. You know, earlier I was talking about uh, non-consensual acts of sexual violence is where one way can, trauma can come from. It can also come from that time when I had sex with someone, I was getting a big old no, it didn't feel good, but I didn't say anything because I didn't want to ruin the moment. And then my body remembered that and kind of numbed out a little bit. And now when I had sex with them again or with someone else, now my body feels a little different, feels a little turned off because I didn't listen to my body. So trauma could happen in all kinds of ways. So this is going to be um, a little bit of an exercise of a practice of really practicing being present in your own body when you're receiving touch, voicing exactly what you want, um, and then we'll bring it up a notch to actually voice some no's. And then for the, the giver, for the person to really um, listen and to negotiate on your end as well and just staying present for the other person and for the touch. 
and to see what it's like to receive a bossy massage. Someone tell you exactly what they want and to tell you when they don't want it anymore and see what comes up for you around that. Um, so I'll demo with Gina and then we'll invite you. Should we have them get in pairs now before we demo, do you think? Or? Uh, as yeah, out. totally, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That's one thing, uh, if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear me say a million times, go slower than slow, and then go slower than that. Like, whatever you thought slow and soft, too, whatever you thought slow and soft was, you know, is just, just slow that down even more, like moving through molasses. And this isn't for all touch, but especially for initial touch, because skin on skin is acclimating to each other. You know, my first instinct, too, is, is more pressure or, or often faster, but when we slow it down, it warms the skin up and the body up, and it's ready to receive more, and then you can build it up over time to move faster or with more pressure. Um, so yeah, it goes hand in hand with that. One other person want to share anything? Yeah? So I observed them. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was like weirdly relaxing. Oh, was it? <laughs> like, did you feel like you were getting massaged? Like, ah, yeah. yeah. Like almost Nice. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> that we call transference. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any one other person? Are we move forward? Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for playing. Um, this is something if you have um, lovers, partners, these are great things to actually practice with um, those people because then you can actually teach each other these skills and also learn more about what kind of touch they like like you're talking about the pressure thing how you like a softer touch but your instinct is to maybe do more pressure and if you do this with partners and lovers um, then you can learn those kind of things oh yeah you actually like a softer touch to start and I just didn't even think about that I didn't had no idea or oh it's actually really hard for me to hear you say stop and no it brings up a lot of rejection for me um, so there's, there's a lot that can happen there that's really, really helpful in these practices. This was an abbreviated, kind of playful version, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Okay, so uh, I have limited time here, so I'm going to just go in real quickly to some things that are also on the podcast. So if you go to the Shameless Sex podcast and, oh geez, you listen to uh, episode number two episode, that's uh, a P, Jesus, Gina, that's why I have you write when we teach together. <laughs> I do, like, Gina, you write, I'll be over here. Um, episode number two uh, is all about this, asking for what you want, and also understanding what it, how to, what it is that you want. Um, I'll give you a very quick abbreviated version that I think is really, really helpful, and that is uh, from the book, The Erotic Mind, by someone named Jack Morin. Uh, I love, love, love uh, this idea about the, about the more important question not being what is it that I want in touch or be in touch, it's how do I want to feel in intimacy, right? So with, does anyone have this experience when someone says, what do you like, what do you want? You're like, I don't know, just try some things. Probably happened today in here for some of you, right? I don't know, just try some things out. <laughs> But what's, so, so it can, we can get that block, it can be very confusing, and that what we want often changes. Yesterday I may have wanted a lot of pressure, but now I really want light touch. Um, but the more important question that we're, that I, that I really love and that I teach from, and it's based on what Jack Moran says, is, is how do I want to feel when I'm touching and being touched? So what is the energy that I want? How do I want to feel during it, and how do I want to feel when I leave? Uh, and the book actually talks about there are some ways to figure out how you want to feel. And let, some of you might already know how you want to feel when you're touching or being touched, and some of you may not. Uh, but it has a whole formula on there that we talk about in episode two of the Shameless Sex podcast. Um, and the abbreviated version of that that I'll tell you really quickly, but again, listen more or you can um, read the book, which is pretty lengthy, but if you're kind of a sex nerd, then it's inter- very interesting. Um, it says the idea is to look at two to three of your top favorite sexual fantasies, experiences that you've had, uh, or maybe things that you've heard of, or maybe the porn that you watch, or like when you're self pleasuring, you're masturbating in your spank bank material, like that scene in your head that gets you off, where you're like, ooh, that's the hottest thing ever, those things. You, you kind of paint the picture of what those look like. What's the energy like? Who was there? Who was doing what? If it's porn, usually you're, you're somehow identifying with someone in there. Um, and you kind of paint the picture and then you look at the, the theme there. How is it that I want to feel in all of these fantasies? Or if I'm that, you know, the centerpiece of the gangbang in the porn or whatever it is that you're, in, you're into or the, the actual experience you had, like, I don't know, you're getting a blow job in the middle of the restaurant when there was a whole bunch of people around and in that to you that was the hottest thing ever. So you paint the picture, you look for the energy that's in that theme. 
There's some really common themes, uh, such as feeling really special, feeling the best. Like, I gave them so many orgasms, I am the best. And when they're like, you're the best ever, the best sex I've ever had. And um, also, uh, for me, my theme is to feel taken care of. It's not by lavish gifts and things like that. It's emotionally and energetically taken care of. Um, and so there's so many, you get to decide what it is. Maybe it's worshipped, it's honored, it's adored, it's possessed. You get to decide what that is for you. And once you know what that is, then you can present that to partners and lovers. Like, hey, I don't know exactly what I want, but this is how I want to feel. I want to feel really worshipped in this. Like, I want to feel just like, I am, ah, and you just worship me. Um, are you game for that? And then, in fact, okay, now it's coming to me. Here are some ways that you can do that. You know, kiss my feet, feed me some grapes, you know, I don't know, pet me, whatever that is. Uh, for me, wanting to feel taken care of, uh, that's, that is emotionally and energetically taken care of. Um, I want my, for me, my strong masculine partner to come and just take control, uh, but it can also be in a very tantric way, like a softer way. It's not just like sometimes it is dominance and submission, and sometimes it's more of a tantric way where they're just like, you can you can have crygasms and screamgasms, and I'm just I'm gonna hold all this for you because I got this, um, and that gives me that feeling that I desire. And just fun fact about this feeling, it comes from your childhood. I know it's great. For a lot, oftentimes it comes from our uh, relationships with our parents or their primary caregivers of the energy or what they did or did not, um, how they did or did not show up for you. So for me, daddy issues, right? Um, my dad was physically there, but emotionally he wasn't really available for all of my emotions. If I, sometimes if I cried in front of him, he would laugh in my face. Um, and not all the time, but that did happen a couple of times. And I, I truly believe that that's why I'm wanting the strong masculine figure to just be like, you can show all of me and I can, I'll take, I can hold this. That's me. You will all be different. Some of you might resonate with that, but it's a really wonderful exercise to do. So again, go to episode two um, and you can learn more about that. And uh, it can be really, really helpful. How to ask for what we want. We kind of practiced it a little bit in here. Uh, and I'll do a, just abbreviated version of that. Uh, if you're asking for something that's really big, like the example I used earlier, you want to open up a relationship, um, I suggest not doing it when people are naked and having sex <laughs> because it's a very vulnerable, intimate space. Um, I recommend having the really challenging conversations about sex outside of the bedroom. So, um, and also when people are, yes, when they're in good spirits and they're not in a hurry. So like, oh, your partner's like, I got to run out the door to go to work. You're like, hey, can we open our relationship up? And they're like, Ugh. Or you just, my whole day is now kind of screwed. <laughs> and instead, I recommend asking permission, hey, this one is really important to me. This is a big, big thing for me and I'd like to talk to you about it. Is now a good time or if not, can we schedule a time? And then they're gonna be like, oh God, what's coming next? Uh, and if they say now's a good time, then you can present it there. But again, not in the bedroom. So maybe sitting on the couch, maybe going for a walk, something along those lines. If it's something that is the smaller, but it's about sex and the touch, so it's not a huge thing like I wanna break up with you. And <laughs> that, again, not while, while you're having sex, probably not a good idea. But say it is someone's you know, touching my nipples and they're like, man, you like that, don't you? And I'm like, oh my God, this is <laughs> terrible. Like, that actually already doesn't feel good doing that. Um, and so I wanted to guide them to touch that I prefer. We just did bossy massage. So if they were doing that, I was like, stop. That can scare people and cause shame. So what we did in bossy massage is designed as a practice. If you actually bring it into partnership without pre-negotiating that you get to just say, stop this, yes, this, not that. It can scare people, like they can go through a shame process of, oh, I'm, I'm doing it wrong, I'm, I don't want to do that anymore. So the bossy massage we did, great exercise, designed to be an exercise. Um, and so for this kind of thing, someone's rubbing my nipples, um, I can say something along the lines of, you know, if it really is hurting, then I, of course I can say a no or a stop if it's really crossing a boundary. And if I have some spaciousness here, like I'm not highly triggered, um, then I can say something along the lines of, a positive reinforcement that is authentic. I love when you touch my breasts. I don't love the way they're touching my nipples, so I wouldn't say that. Um, but I love when you touch my breasts and, not but, and what I love a little more is if you just went a little softer and slower and they're like, oh, okay, I can do that. I'm not doing a terrible job. Versus if I was just like, ow, that hurts. You always do it wrong. Oh my God, they're probably not gonna wanna touch my breasts again. And then I just lost because I actually do like having my breasts touch. I just don't like it like this. So. Positive reinforcement that is authentic, so no bullshit, 
um, followed by the word and, followed by the critique of what it is that you actually really want. Um, is it easy formula? Again, if you're highly triggered, you're like starting to disassociate or something is going, you're going through a trauma response, this probably won't be available. That's when you will probably say stop or no. That's okay. But if there is spaciousness to voice from this place, it can create, it's a softer landing and you often can actually get what you want. Uh, and then we, the bossy massage that we just did, you, I just want to put this out there. I, did anyone notice that they were saying, maybe you try this or, or maybe a little of that instead of just saying, I want this, give me that? Did anyone notice a, little, a lot of maybes? Yeah. We also very much live in a maybe culture. There's like a, it's, like a, it's like a softer way of being like, I don't know. Like, it's like a less straightforward, like this is what I want, right? Um, so just putting that out there to notice how often you're kind of, it's like a little minor sugar coating-ish of our language. Um, and to also really notice when, where your yeses, nos, and maybes com are coming from your body, um, when you're overriding your, with your head of what a yes, no, and maybe is. Um, a, really, our, our, a really true yes, no, maybe it comes from in here. And yes, this br our brain is really responsible for um, getting more clear on safety and various things with boundaries and past experiences. Um, but from this place is where we really feel that gut feeling like I'm feeling a hard no right now or I'm feeling a fuck yes right now. Um, and or I'm feeling a maybe. I'm feeling a, I really, a true maybe. I really don't know. Um, and a, what, what you can do with a maybe is just voice that. I'm feeling maybe I don't know. We can start to try it. And if I get a no, then I'm going to honor my no. Um, and just follow the thread. That really is what a lot of this negotiation is in, in relationship. Isn't just because I say, oh yeah, I'm a yes to sex. And we start having sex because I said yes. Now I have to stay a yes to sex. It's I follow the thread. I'm a yes to sex. We're having sex. Ooh, I'm now a no. And that's okay. So you're following the thread of all that comes up the whole time, every time you touch, and you're sharing with your partners, your lovers, throughout the entire process, and you're inviting them to do the same. This is truly negotiated, consensual sex. It is never just like what I was into and said yes to yesterday applies today, and it is not what I said a yes to five seconds ago applies now, because that can change right now too. So just some important distinctions. Um, I obviously am not going to have time to bring out my vulva puppet and tell you all about how to touch it, but <laughs> um, the workshops though, you have the online workshops with the free codes. There are uh, the options there, I think there's an anal sex 101, uh, it's all me teaching, um, and no, you don't get to see an actual butt, the butt is my hand. Um, it is a, um, there's a how to please a vulva 101, a how to please a penis 101, so all that stuff I'm talking, would maybe have commented a little bit on will be in there for you to check out. It's my vulva puppet though, isn't it cute? Yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, and just one thing I will uh, say on this um, is, uh, there's a wonderful book that I love called Come As You Are. Um, we have it at Pure Pleasure, and I don't know if any of you have read it or heard about it. It's also an audible uh, that says that we are all made of the same parts. They're just organized in different places. Um, and so a lot of the touch techniques that I teach for what vulva is like is very similar to what a penis and all kinds of other bits will like. They're literally just similar parts just put in different places in regards to the nerve endings. Um, but my one advice I will say to you other than presence is really big, consent of course, and um, like I said earlier, go slower than slow and then slower than that. And like really letting skin on skin acclimate to each other when you're touching. And by the way, vulvas, they take about four times as long to get um, blood flow and arousal than penises. So just because a rock hard penis is ready to go does not mean a vulva is ready to go. Um, speaking to if penises and vulvas are, are playing. So just something to keep in mind and check out that book. And we have so many episodes on the Shameless Sex Podcast about all that stuff. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and ask if you have questions about anything. Yes? Uh, you had said uh, when, when oh, to stay away from words like uh, maybe and just that same, same go for like, please and thank you because it's not very you can, consensual. Yeah. It is, so it is, you can say, I'm saying, you don't have to stay away from maybe, I'm saying just notice 
Notice how often you're actually not being straightforward about what it is you want and there's a part of you that's trying to kind of sugarcoat something to make it like a so safe, feel safer. Um, so just noticing, it's not stay away. The words I'd say stay away from are always and never. Always stay away from always and never. Because when I tell you you always do this wrong or I always want this or you never this or it's, it can be highly triggering because it totally discredits all the things that they've done. Um, so those are those and that's a little different and then please Please is totally fine. Just noticing what is the intention behind the word when I'm saying it. What is it when I make a sentence saying, "Here's what I want." What is my intention behind it? And then thank you is wonderful. And I don't think that we need to get away from thank you. But again, noticing the intention and uh, and when we thank someone for doing something. So uh, for, this is really important actually. If someone's doing something that you like, that like they're touching what you like. Please tell them that you like that because it means you're more likely to, to get that. And thanking them can be a part of it. Like, thank you, I really appreciate this stuff right now. This feels really, really good. So yeah, you know, it's just noticing the intention. It's not necessarily getting away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious as far as what you were talking about with the disassociation. Uh -huh. um, is there different levels of disassociation? Or not different levels, but like for different um, groups, like if it's... Uh, women in the in a, a straight relationship mm -hmm. or uh, the bottom in a gay relationship or anything like that are they more likely to be disassociated no it's it's i don't think you can look at i, I don't think the disassociation is necessarily going to come from the type of sex that you're having i mean it can but i don't think there's a hierarchy or like a big distinction where we could put it in categories mm -hmm. Everyone, anyone, I could disassociate from being a, a dom. You know, I could have an experience that it totally puts me in some disassociation because of some past trauma that it reminds me of. I can disassociate something that has nothing to do with sex but reminds me of sexual trauma. Um, so it's in a disassociation, what that feels like is I'm not, I'm having a hard time being present. You see someone disassociating, their eyes can glaze over, or they can kind of be looking at you, but they're looking over there. Um, it feels like a numbness or I'm not here, but it, there is not really like one category of where I think it necessarily happens the most. Sure, being in a receive, receiving position, especially if you're being penetrated, yeah. might be um, more likely, but I don't know if it's helpful to like narrow that down that way. One more question? Anyone else? I also brought for you all lube samples of Uber lube. Uberlib, yeah. So if you haven't tried Uberlib.